everyone, Nicole Stackline here in East Central Iowa. There's a lot going on out there right now. And as I like to say, scouting is probably your cheapest management technique because not only can you make better informed decisions, but then you know where to put your resources and where they're gonna be more effective. So in my opinion, there's three main timings when we need to be scouting our corn crop. Number one is as it emerges, making sure that we have a good stand, an even stand and a healthy stand, making sure you're not gonna get some sort of seedling disease that's gonna pull it backwards. Number two is right now. We're looking for disease, we're looking for insects, we wanna make sure that we're pollinated. And then the third most important timing is before harvest, going out and doing those push tests, making sure that if there's fields that we have to prioritize our harvest, we're getting there in time. Right now, what we need to be looking for is number one, diseases. There's a lot of northern corn leaf blight out there. We're starting to see tar spot build its population in the lower canopy, and then gray leaf spot has entered the chat, and so has southern rust. The next thing we really need to be looking at is obviously in East Central Iowa, Northeast Iowa, corn rootworm. So we need to be checking for that little pest. And then third, which is something that we typically take for granted is pollination. There's a lot of buzz out there about tassel wrapping. So let's hop in and see what we can see. Right. Everybody's out here like super worried about tar spot. All the while, Northern corn leaf blight is like, ha ha, I got you all tricked. I'm just gonna sneak in here into the upper canopy and start pulling yield off. I mean, we're reaching pretty high up in the canopy here and finding a fair amount of northern corn leaf blight. So, northern corn leaf blight likes it cool. Um, I started walking these fields at noon and I'm still wet from all the leaf wetness. So, northern corn leaf blight really likes leaf wetness, likes it a little bit cooler. We've got a couple of warm days right now. But next week early, uh, we're really supposed to get some, you know, a stretch of weather in the mid to upper 70s. And that northern is just going to love that. So some people will think that something like that is an early northern corn leaf blight uh, lesion. That, that is not what that is. So this looks like probably when that leaf was rolled up, it got some sort of damage to it. And it just kept that chlorophyll from filling in there. What can make northern corn leaf blight so devastating is A, those lesions can get really, really big. So they end up taking all out a lot of photosynthetic leaf tissue um, with just one lesion. Uh, the next thing is that it's latent period or the time that it takes for it to kind of like complete its life cycle and push stuff out is only about two weeks. So when you start seeing it, it can very rapidly, given the right weather conditions, very rapidly spread throughout your field. Ah, here's the talk of the town tar spot. All those little black dots. Tar spot has not been particularly hard to find this year, but it has been hard to find cases where there's, you know, an emergency happening. So what I will typically see in a year is you will have plenty of tar spot that you can find in that lower canopy and it's fine, right? It's there, it's not a big deal. You're tasseling, it's not a huge deal, but maybe you're seeing it start to climb up the plant. When you get to about half milk line and that plant starts to naturally senesce those lower leaves, that's when it becomes more opportunistic and you start seeing it taking down leaf tissue, killing leaves. So if we continue a cooler, wetter pattern, that's what tar spot likes. If you didn't spray with fungicide, it's gonna to continue to proliferate. Like Northern corn leaf blight, tar spot only has about a two week latent period. So again, once you get that, um, that organism rolling and producing spores, you get good weather and it can really take off quickly. Here we have a really classic, really great example of gray leaf spot where it's gonna be more long and it's gonna be rectangular. See how the edges there are really straight because it doesn't like to jump over these different vein lines. So gray leaf spot looks like that, um, more of a rectangular look to it. Here's how it's gonna look in an earlier stage where you don't really quite start seeing those, rec those rectangles because it hasn't really started to stretch out yet. Another really nice example of classic great leaf spot. So here we've got some southern rust. Southern rust, unlike common rust, is gonna be more of like an orangish color where common rust tends to have more of a dark red or brick red color. If you rub it off, 
those spores are usually going to turn your finger an orange color. Now, common rust is not typically yield limiting, but southern rust can be aggressive. It's not usually a huge problem for us because it doesn't usually get a head start, right? It has to actually blow in from the south before it can start to infect. So usually our corn is far enough along before southern rust can really cause much of an issue. However, when we see it early enough in the season, so if you're starting to see southern rust and you're in the blister or the milk stage and we have good conditions, now southern rust does like it to be warm, um, that 77 to 85 degrees, if you have good weather conditions, a susceptible hybrid, you haven't sprayed fungicide, and you're starting to see southern rust in like the milk stage, you could potentially have quite a bit of yield loss from that disease. Another disease that I haven't seen yet, but I am expecting to see, is gases wilt. So the reason that I'm expecting to see more of it is because of the amount of wind damage that we have seen throughout Jackson Jones and Lynn County. So we also have the pathogen present because of a storm in July of 2011 that blew that bacterial pathogen over to Eastern Iowa from Nebraska and the Dakotas. So being a bacterial disease, can we do anything about it? No, but it's important to know if you have that disease and if it if you get it at fairly high rates in that field because of how you're gonna plan for next year. So if you have a year, um, if this year you get a lot of gases wilt, there's a lot of it in the field, you know that next year you wanna be a little bit more sensitive to the hybrid that you're placing in that field to make sure that it's not really sensitive. Let's talk about pollination. So our main issues with pollination in the Midwest typically are related to insect pressure. So whether it's Japanese beetle or corn rootworm beetles, those are our main culprits when it comes to silk clipping. So Midwest, most of our pollination issues are pest related. 2025, we're also having some pretty major pollination issues due to a phenomenon called tassel wrap. And unless you're living under a rock, this is not the first time that you're hearing about it. But in case it is, let me explain it. So tassel wrap is something that happens when you don't get a whole lot of elongation of these nodes here, and then you get that tassel wrapped in these leaves and it keeps those branches from popping out and it covers up those anthers. And so there's no pollen shedding from the bottom part of that tassel. You might be getting a little bit from the tip and that's about it. Other factors that lead to issues with this tassel wrap is also something called missing the nick. So you only get pollen shedding for about 10 days. And at that same time, you need to have viable silks. So there are some hybrids that only overlap viable silks for a couple of days with the pollen shed. So if in those couple of days, the tassel is also wrapped up, all of a sudden you are not getting enough pollen shedding during your small window. That's called missing the nick. Add on to that some pretty high temperatures uh, as we had silking occurring and silks are going to grow until they receive pollen. So silks are gonna grow from the bottom of that ear first and come out as the silks start growing and they're growing and they're growing because they're not receiving pollen, you can get kind of this big old mess of silks at the top of that ear and you're kind of shading out and keeping those first silks that came out from receiving pollen. Some of the things that we're seeing on these ears is that we did get full pollination, but there was a large gap. So you have some kernels that are coming into milk and other kernels that are blistering. So we then, you know, there's some of these places where we did get full pollination eventually. The true problem re lies in the fact that when you have a big gap in stage of those kernels, it's going to abort those late pollinated kernels because it's no longer the priority. It's too far belong. You know, that plant's gonna kill off the weak buffalo and it's going to abort those late pollinated kernels causing yield loss. Can the kernels around it make up for it? Somewhat, but not fully. We've covered diseases and we've covered pollination. The last thing we really need to be keeping an eye on right now is corn rootworm because what we see right now might be influencing and determining how we change our management strategies for 2026. There's two main ways that you kind of assess uh, your population on corn rootworm, and that's beetle trapping or scoring the damage to your roots. So if you're gonna go the beetle trap route, 
the threshold is two beetles per trap per day. So if you go out there and put a sticky trap out in your field and you leave it for five days, if you have 10 corn rootworm beetles on that trap, you may need to be doing something a little bit different for the next year. You at least need to be on high alert. The next way is by digging roots and assessing the amount of damage that was done. Now, the node injury score runs on a scale from zero to three. Zero being, I don't have hardly any feeding on this route, and three being, I have an absolute disaster. Here's how it works. So that node injury scale goes from a one to a three. And basically what we're gonna be doing is evaluating three nodes or three rings of roots. And each ring has a possible top score of one, meaning 100% of the roots on that node are fed to within an inch and a half of the main stalk. So for example, let's say we had 20% of these roots here were fed to within an inch and a half of the main stalk. Then that we would give this first set of roots a score of a 0.2. Then we would go down and evaluate this next set of roots. And if we had, let's say, 10% of this ring of roots was fed within an inch and a half of the stalk, then this set of roots, we get a score of 0.1 for a total current score of a 0.3. And I like to pull these roots back so we can get good visualization of the next ring of roots. And if we got to this next ring of roots here and we didn't have any roots fed within an inch and a half of the stalk, then that set of roots would get a score of zero. So that would give us a total root score on this root of a 0 0.3. So typically a majority of the feeding is going to happen on one, maybe two of those rings of roots. And that's because that growing root is putting out carbon dioxide into the soil. And that is how that rootworm knows how to find that root. So whichever set of roots was actively growing during most of that feeding, that's the set of roots that's going to have the most damage. Okay, so we've got our number, cool. But what does the number actually mean? Well, if you get a traded corn product out there and you end up with a total root score of between 0.5 and 0.75, meaning that you've got a half to three quarters of a ring of roots fed to within an inch and a half of a stalk, that's kind of your light bulb moment. Hey, I need to do something different for next year. All right, if you made it this far, kudos. That was a lot of information. But if you have any questions to follow up, you can always call, text, or email.